Good day, everyone, and welcome. I'm Jack Van Horn from the University of Virginia. Please allow me to welcome you to this edition of our 2020-2021 Foundations of Biomedical Data Science Seminar Series. This lecture is supported by UVA's Integrated Translational Health Institute of Virginia, the UVA Brain Institute, the College of Arts and Sciences, the School of Data Science, and by a grant from the National Institutes of General Medical Sciences. It is my honor and privilege today to welcome our speaker, Dr. Ivo Dinov from the University of Michigan. He earned his Bachelor of Science degree from Sofia University in Sofia, Bulgaria in 1991, followed by two master's degrees, uh, one at the uh, Michigan Technological University and another from Florida State University, followed by his PhD also from Florida State University in Tallahassee. Uh, Dr. Dinov is Professor of Health and Behavior, Health Behavior and Biological Sciences and Computational Medicine and Bioinformatics at the University of Michigan. Prior to his current position at Michigan, Dr. Dinov was on the faculty in statistics at the University of California, Los Angeles for many years. At Michigan, Dr. Dinov serves as the director of the Statistics Online Computational Resource and is an expert in mathematical modeling, statistical analysis, high throughput computing, scientific visualization of big biomedical data sets. His applied research is focused on neuroscience, nursing informatics, multimodal biomedical image analysis, and distributed genomic computing. Examples of specific brain research projects in which Dr. Dinov is involved include longitudinal morphometric studies of, developing, of the developing brain in autism, as well as in psychiatry and schizophrenia, brain maturation, um, also diseases such as depression and phenomena such as pain perception and uh, in aging in Alzheimer's disease as well as in Parkinson's disease. He also studies the intricate relations between genetic traits, clinical phenotypes, um, and subject demographics in a variety of brain as well as heart-related clinical disorders. Dr. Dinov is currently working to develop and validate and disseminate novel technology-enhancing pedagogical Approaches for Science Education and Active Learning. Dr. Dino's lecture today is entitled Big Data Neuroscience, Data Sharing and Predictive Health Analytics. And as always, if you are streaming this lecture live and for recording by, uh, sorry, we are streaming this lecture live and for recording via YouTube. If you are watching via YouTube, thank you so much for joining us. Also, our specially selected 2020-2021 Biomedical Data Science Innovation Lab participants are strongly encouraged to submit any questions for Dr. Dino via the chat feature in their Zoom sessions. I will personally synthesize these questions and ask them on your behalf during the last 10 minutes or so of the lecture. And with that, thank you so much, Evo. We sure appreciate you sharing your work with us today. Thanks again. We look forward to it. Thank you very much, Dr. Van Horn. Uh, I appreciate the invitation. Um, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you for joining as well. So um, in my um, talk today, I'll, I'll speak about some of the um, big neuroscience and data sharing challenges and show you some examples of techniques that we've developed specifically for predictive health analytics. Now, by the way, for those of you that are interested, uh, the slides, um, I'm a firm believer of open science. Uh, if it's not online, it doesn't exist for me. So the slides are available online. If you Google Soccer News, go to today's date, you'll find the slides so that you can follow up more closely if you like. So in this talk, um, I've broken it into three pieces that will hopefully make sense to, to folks and they kind of build on top of each other. We're gonna start first by discussing some of the open, uh, open science pillars uh, that are important, especially when you talk about big neuroscience data. Uh, then in the second theme, I, I, I'll, I'll present some health analytics challenges and more specifically describe a technique that we recently developed called Data Sifter that does a novel statistical obfuscation that breaks a very important barrier in science. How do we share data effectively and securely without compromising uh, personal uh, information? Uh, and in the last part of the talk, I'll, I'll show you some uh, case studies. Uh, specifically uh, Lou Gehrig's disease, uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. Then uh, the second example would be with the uh, population census-like neuroscience based on the UK biobank data. And then finally, I'll tell you about some really exciting technique that we are um, publishing this year, something called space time analytics, where time refers to complex time. So with that, let's just start uh, in the very beginning. You know, wh what is open science and what are the the key constituents. So on one level, you know, the obvious, the usual suspects, right? Data, data metadata describing the data, etc. 
experimental designs, you know, you need hardware, you need software, you need tools, and then you need on the next level, you need cloud services, transdisciplinary collaborations, and then what streams out of these multiple levels of sources and infrastructure is the results, findings, uh, discoveries that are typically shared or published or communicated somehow with, with, with the rest of the community. So these are the, the core principles and, you know, um, they're, they're important to realize and I know most of us probably already have uh, that understanding. In terms of what are the characteristics and the challenges that are involved in big biomedical and more specifically neuroscience data. So in this table here, on, in the left column, I list the, the seven big dimensions or characteristics or properties of big data that we see. And the next column explains why are these important and how do they present technical and non-technical challenges. So for example, you know, these big neuroscience data sets, they're sizable, they're voluminous. Um, and you know, the notion of uh, harvesting and managing vast amounts of information is a huge challenge. You know, we're talking about zeta byte of, of data and I'll show you some graphs very soon. Second of all, the data is, is very complex. It's not just spreadsheets, it's not just structured data. It requires wrangling, it requires manipulation of heterogeneous data elements and so forth. So very significant challenges. Uh, these data is very oftentimes incongruent, which presents problems when you have to make it computable data objects. You need to do some aggregation, you need to do some harmonization of data to make it computable. Many a times the data arrives from multiple sources, as I'll show you, that are not intended, designed, or necessarily interoperable. So there is a whole bunch of uh, challenges with the transferring the joint multivariate representation. And that's where the beef of the work is and modeling of some of these data. The data is oftentimes multi-scale. So you can look at the same brain from the macroscopic level of the MRI or the PET imaging at one millimeter resolution down to the mesoscale, the micro scale and the nano scale. You can go on the angstrom resolution if you have the right device so the same sample, the same substrate can be looked at multiple scale. How do you actually do the analytics on something that's on multi-scale? It's an open problem. This data very often times has a longitudinal demand that requires techniques that are very sensitive to these intrinsic temporal correlations that are embedded in the data. And finally, but certainly not less important, is the fact that this data is never complete. So you need very powerful methods to um, impute and manage some of these data. And this is just one example here on the right-hand side with Parkinson's disease, where we have thousands of individuals and 10,000 of biomarkers uh, that we've published on. And, and you know, the managing that requires a lot of manipulation. Now on this slide, uh, it is important for us to have a 30,000 feet interpretation of what is really big data. You know, how does it fall between a census of the native process, the native process is in the left column here, and on the right-hand side, what is the classical observational data inference, right? Small samples. So in this example here, suppose you have the gold blue is, is your data, this image is your data. This is the natural process. It's most of the time natural processes are not observable. Samples from these natural processes are observable and that's what we see. Well, the big data is the stuff that's kind of in between, right? It's got a little bit more data. It could be also misleading. It's got a lot of problems. Um, you know, the samples are limited in this case. There are a bunch of assumptions, randomness, independence, identical distributions and whatnot. Uh, here in this space, most of these assumptions are broken. There is all kinds of other problems, but we're gonna be operating for the purpose of this talk. We are gonna be operating in this middle layer here between the natural processes and classical traditional sample-based uh, inference. Now, in this slide, I, what I'm trying to make is a very simple argument. Data science is about information compression. So, you know, the notion that um, in 200 years, you know, from 1798, when Henry Cavendish did this incredible uh, experiment by measuring the, uh, mean, the, the mean density of the Earth by 23 observations. You know, it was incredible. The guy was a, 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 a very clever scientist, polymath for that matter, uh, that acquired 20, 23 observations to measure the mean density of the earth because he was interested in what is the mass of the earth. 
because having the mass of the Earth is going to tell you what the attraction forces with celestial bodies are, right? The moon, the sun, you know, having an accurate estimate of the mass of the Earth is critical. Now, obviously, the volume you can extrapolate, but the density, the mean density, when you multiply the volume by the density, that kind of gives you the mass. And his estimate um, was that it's about 5.4 times the density of a water molecule, give or take a little bit, okay? Turns out his estimate is with the current precise estimate of the mean density, uh, 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 the mean density of the Earth is precisely within the confidence limit that Cavendish estimated with 23 observations. Now, in the current point in time, most of us realize that 23 is not going to get you anywhere. You need two to the 23 observations, which, by the way, is 10 million, to, to get anything interesting out of data. And that's where we are. We are in this space where the scalability and the data compression needs to come in and play an important role in the scientific discovery. Now, in this little diagram, before we get into the more technical aspects, I want to outline a, a typical pipeline workflow of how big neuroscience data projects evolve. In the left column, you start off typically with raw bits and bytes and surveys and blood tests and all kinds of other measurements that by themselves are very um, kind of structured, right? But we're not interested in these bits and bytes. We're interested in information that they carry. And in this little schematic, I'm kind of illustrating how the bits and bytes that represent photon uh, precessions are converted into flat images, okay, two-dimensional images, and these are observable objects. We can actually reconstruct these. What's not observable is the cortical surface, which we now go on a tertiary level. You see, we reconstruct it by infusing models with real observations to actually deduce the folding of the brain. And once you have these kind of information that leads you to knowledge and the knowledge allows you to you know parcelate the brain into three-dimensional puzzle pieces which we call regions of interest these regions of interest allow you to do very interesting morphometry studies where you measure the volume the surface area the fractal dimension the curvature the shape index a whole bunch of morphometry measures on each of these um, regional locations and these morphometry measures are the key to establishing homologies between individuals because two brains can never be made perfectly homologous. Voxel by voxel is what I mean. However, when you, when you parcelate the brains, you can, various morphometry measures that you can derive from this can be made into, homo, into data computable objects. And that's where the action comes up at the far right that tells you now that you have this information, you can find out who are the populations that are more predisposed for this condition, who are the populations that tend to live longer, have, not, have better quality of life and so forth. And obviously these decisions are gonna feed you back into collecting new data. And so the process, the cyclical process of big data to uh, action continues. Now, uh, I am fairly sure that most of you are firm believers, so I don't have to spend a whole lot of time here, but it is important to understand that uh, the notion of data sharing is critical if we are going to be uh, making sustained advances forward. One of the elements that I just want to mention is the Kreider's Law, and the Kreider's Law dictates that the volume of data increases exponentially, um, which can be compared to the Moore's Law, which gives you an exponential increase in the compute power. The really interesting uh, phenomenon here is that the Kreider's law outperforms the Moore's law. In other words, the rate at which we collect data outpaces the, way, the, the rate at which our computational power increases. So we have to be very, very sensitive of you know, hoarding data because with hoarding of the data, its value decreases exponentially as well. So there's a lot of intricate notions. So most of us are from supporters of findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable, and recyclable data sets. Uh, as you can imagine, over the past decade, uh, and actually two decades, a huge cloud ecosystem has emerged that has, you know, backend database constructs, workflow mechanisms, analytical platforms, big data to knowledge uh, uh, interfaces, 
and so forth. So uh, th there is a lot that's done and there is a lot more that are done every day to add to these cloud services, but they're important for the scientific discovery. Uh, Professor Van Horn and myself and, and others have uh, built over the past, uh, again, uh, over a decade now, an environment that we call the pipeline graphical workflow environment that allows you to do large-scale computing on massive amounts of heterogeneous data, data that had these seven characteristics that I outlined early on, right? When you have to have, some of our, sometimes our data has to go literally through hundreds of steps. Imagine having to do this one step at a time uh, for one case or one subject individually. It's practically impossible for thousands of, of patients with a uh, with, with variety of uh, uh, kind of information for each patient. So we build a pipeline graphical workflow environment that allows us to automate this notion of designing a graphical protocol in a canvas where each module is an executable or a group of executable modules and it gets fed various data sets and it outputs various data sets that are fed downstream to the next module. So it's, it's a very powerful uh, mechanism that we've developed. Now, in terms of uh, to in terms of open science, you know, sharing data is insufficient. You know, open access publications. Many of us are huge supporters. I just want to remind you. You know, recently uh, G Grigory Perlman proved uh, 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 Poincaré's conjecture in uh, about 15 years ago by publishing two open access papers on archive. You know, the guy sits in his office, publishes two papers, publishes uh, proves a result that's a hundred years old in the standing. Hundreds and thousands of people have died very sad for not being able to prove it. And now it's, it's fully documented into open access papers. Please do consider the notion of open access publications are great. Consider also things like blogs. Uh, the mathematics community has proven a whole bunch of theorems by literally starting a blog on a topic. When people chime in from different perspectives, all of a sudden a proof emerges. Incredible feats. Now, there's also cloud services. Many of these are not open, but the uh, Cranium uh, pipeline uh, grid server that we have is available at USC. Uh, there is also software hubs for sharing data. You can look at some of ours. Uh, there is also learning modules. Look at the DSPA, the Data Science and Predictive Analytics. We have six to seven million users downloading some of these books uh, that we've built for, for uh, our based predictive analytics. Um, and then licensing. When it comes to licensing, ultimately, in, in, our, in our group, in the soccer resource, we use CC by permissive licenses for content. And then, and then um, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, lesser GNU license for the software code. So th these are all parts of the notion of an, of an open science. Now, there are some cons with open science, right? I mean, you know, I've heard people being concerned of somebody scooping them or, or getting something published before they can. You know, there is also the notion of predatory science, journals, you know, but these are, these are small troubles that most of the time are easy to, uh, to uh, resolve, you know. Um, but there are significant pros, okay? And one of the most significant pros to open science is that the return on investment is substantially and rapidly increased when we share information, knowledge, data, protocols, and techniques. So expeditious discovery, um, you know, long-term sustainability of a project. I mean, everybody knows, you know, students leave, postdocs graduate, you know, uh, people move on in their careers. You know, the, the notion of opening uh, something to the community allows collective um, uh, support for long-term sustainability of obviously not every project, but the projects that are worth support. And the last point I want to make here is that, especially with data sets, holding data uh, and doing clandestine science uh, is obfuscated science. It rapidly decreases the value of any of these. And here is just one uh, pseudo example that I'm showing you. If you stop, uh, you know, the value of your data ex exponentially increases as you keep collecting it. The moment you stop collecting it, its value begins to diminish. The more you hoard it, the less valuable it is. Now, this slide simply uh, p points out uh, for, for the cases of neuroimaging and genomics, this very interesting paradigm that they're both increasing exponentially, 
but the amount of volume that we're collecting increases much faster than our computational power to manage it. Now, let me tell you about the first thing that we have developed. Uh, people say, you know, people have been hiding for, uh, quite frankly, decades now behind uh, IRB regulations, uh, FERPA, HIPAA regulations, and so forth. Uh, this is not a barrier anymore. There are at least three different strategies that allow you to manipulate your data to make it non-human. One is called epsilon differential privacy. One is called fully homomorphic encryption. We have developed a third level of strategy called statistical obfuscation via data sifting. So this is, we have a pattern to this, we have publications. You don't have to use our technique. The important is that, uh, and, and it's actually available on GitHub as you can see, we have a mechanism to allow a full spectrum of sharing of data where for one of the levels of this ADA parameter, which, which is actually a composite parameter of a whole bunch of other moving parts or variables or control parameters. So we, we, we synthesize this into a single parameter that says if ADA is zero, you release the data on the clear. That's one of the extreme. And as ADA increases all the way up to one, at the level of one, you don't release human subject data. What you release is synthetic simulated data from the model join distribution. So I hope everybody can, can, can see here that if you have a data set that's you know, um, uh, very powerful that people might be able, outside of your immediate collaborator group or outside of your skill set, might be able to do something interesting with it. With a data sifter, you can statistically perfectly obfuscate it to the point where you release simulated version of it, which is going to have a little bit of a compromised energy or information content, but nonetheless, it's going to be a representative sample from the same space, from the same state space that the actual data is collected from, except that it's not human because it's synthesized. This, there is zero reasons not to share it. So if anybody tells you that there is a reason why they cannot share the data, they're not telling you the truth. A little bit about the data sifter here uh, that I want to mention. Let's look at this little animation. You have two users, Jane and Joe, from different institutions. They don't know about each other, but they know of a health system that has some data that they want to try their techniques on. So they fire up a request to the health system and say, hey, do you guys have subjects that fit that profile? We're looking for a cohort. That query is being translated into SQL, structured query language, or no SQL query. The institution looks locally, it identifies the cases, it sends them to the data sifting process by controlling this level, how comfortable am I sharing any data with Jane and Joe? If Jane and Joe are uh, balkanized, uh, unknown subjects, we're gonna go all the way up to one. We don't trust them at all. We're gonna pipe the data through this iterative statistical obfuscation process in which you know data is being manipulated in a very clever way multiple times with the goal being two points. First of all, preserve at every step of this iterative process, preserve the distribution of the joint features. And the second goal is generate a complete data set, complete, computable, usable object that can be sent to the user Jane and Joe. They can go ahead and do their magic, you know, develop a graphical workflow environment, pipe the data through it, generate some results, and then hopefully they're good citizens, and they go back to the health system and say, hey, this is what we found. Uh, are you willing to dial down a little bit the obfuscation to send us a little bit more signal, to send us data with a little bit more information, with higher utility? And as these partnerships form, you can all imagine that it's going to be better for all human experiences and certainly for managing human health. Now, somebody's going to ask, well, how do you know that this thing works? And what is the effect of that manipulation, this magic that you're doing on the data? Well, in this graph here, I'm just showing you on the horizontal axis, we have data released on the clear, no, no manipulation, small level of obfuscation. In the middle, we have uh, um, a moderate level of obfuscation, large level of obfuscation. At the extreme, you synthetically sample from the data. Now, on the vertical axis, you have an estimate of what proportion of the uh, uh, features are being altered for every case. And as you can imagine, 
most of the data with higher obfuscation, most of the data elements are going to be twisted. They're going to be manipulated in a very clever way. And you can see the different colors simply represents binary uh, features, uh, uh, categorical features, continuous features. In the second level of validation that we've done, we've looked at, you know, how do various, I mean, is this obfuscation process changing my inference? I mean, that's the biggest question that anybody wants to know after the question of, is my data secure when I obfuscate it? So the second question about, are you preserving the utility of the information is answered by looking at how does, again, on the horizontal axis, level of obfuscation from no to high extreme obfuscation, how is it changing the level of the true positives in this logistic model that we've used here uh, in, in this case? And as you can see, you know, the true positives are going to decrease. In other words, we're going to be committing a lot more fa false positive errors, as you can see up here on the right plot as well. The, the false inference is going to be increasing with the level of obfuscation. And this is to be expected, right? But nonetheless, you still can make some inference at the most extreme uh, synthetic data generation mode of the whole system. Um, and ju just to give you uh, w one uh, last example here in, in this data sifter algorithm, we have looked at, at a large database called a byte database, which stands for uh, Autism Brain Imaging Data Exchange. And just to give you an idea of what does this data sift in at different levels of statistical obfuscation do, we pulled out a random subject, a 20-second abide uh, pediatric case from the database. Originally, this was an autistic kid, a male of age 31, and the acquisition plane, in, it, it, it's referring to the structural MRI data, was, was a certain type. Um, and um, we, we can see that we have different measures of cortical thickness, curvature, and a Gaussian feature, and so forth. And as we, as we increase, each row represents a different level of increasing the manipulation of the data. You see, at the extreme case at the bottom, this individual from a patient became a control. The age was changed. Even the acquisition plane was changed. So somebody's going to say, this is insane. How is this making sense? Well, this is precisely what's intended to do. On an individual case by case, the data sifter manipulates the data to the point where it's unrecognizable. But nobody wants to use the data sifter to do precision individualized medicine. You want to use the data sifter to do cohort-based or population-wide studies. And that's where the power of this approach comes. Because I'm not interested in any one of the subjects. I'm interested in the joint information that they carry collectively. And that information is being protected, not perfectly preserved, but protected as you dial up the level of your statistical obfuscation. Okay, let me now show you one case, one different case for, for a normal cohort population. So this is the uh, United Kingdom biobank data. Uh, you know, they need to be commanded. In the UK, you know, they, they did this right. They, they started uh, close to 10 years ago. They decided, look, we have so much talent in this country and we have so much data, except that our STEM investigators don't have access to clinical data. What are we going to do about it? Said, and they said, you know, well, in fact, UK is a small nation, whatever, 80 million people, maybe 60, I don't know the exact number. But what about, what about globalizing and letting all the 8 billion people out there help us extract, remember, in my synthetic workflow, go from the raw data to information, to knowledge, and to action. So they saw the light over a decade ago, and they decided we're gonna do this. So millions of people have committed to contribute to this data set. Now, obviously there is proper regulations, people sign data use agreements, IRB approvals, you know, this is done in the right way. We are part of a team that has an agreement to use the UK biobank data. Here's the reference. Anybody, it's public data set, you can apply, you can get this data. Now, um, in our case, we looked at uh, a half a million patients, and we extracted all the patients that had imaging data and about 4,000 clinical features about these individuals. Now, the imaging data included T1 weighted, fMRI, and, and so forth, and it also had genetics data. So what we're going to be doing now here is imagine 4,000 features 
the imaging data, it's a mess, you know. And even if you have only about 10,000 individuals that have all of these data, the problem is complex for multiple reasons. Here is one reason. If you guys remember, again, in the very beginning, when I outlined the seven dimension of big data, I said the last but not least important characteristic was that it's never complete. Now, here are the most frequently observed. Remember, there is 4,000 clinical features. I'm just plotting the most frequently observed for these 10,000 individuals uh, uh, features, and there is the features that have at least 30% of the cases a measurement for that feature. So you see, there is precisely 1,475 of these features out of 4,000 were at least 30% observed. Everything else is very, very sparsely observed, okay? And on the vertical, I'm showing you out of the 10,000, how many individuals actually have these features. So you look at this pattern, the point I'm trying to get across is that the missingness is not at random. And because missingness is not at random, this presents a huge problem when it comes to doing imputation, statistical inference, even machine learning and model-free model inference. So what we've done for this, you know, capitalizing on what I mentioned earlier, cloud services, the pipeline graphical workflow environment. We build a workflow that has about 98 different steps that all the data needs to go through, all the way up from the volumetric pre-processing, the parcelization that I show you, the extraction of the morphometry features, because we are trying to establish homologies between the brains of all these individuals, because we already have the homologies between the clinical features, right? The clinical features, they're precise columns in our data. We don't have homologies between the brains. We establish the homologies between the brains, using this pipeline workflow. And as you can imagine, on this massive scale, hundreds of processing steps, uh, uh, you know, thousands of individuals, everything is not gonna be perfect. So in this specific case, I have 97% completion rate. Sometimes I have 99% completion rate. Some modules are canceled, most are successful, but I can drill down and find out why and how any of these modules failed. And if so, what was the cause of failure? So we build this protocol, right? We, we start off with these half a million observations, 4,300 features. Then we have 10,000 of these individuals for which we extracted 3,200 derived neuroimaging biomarkers, just like I told you, right? We parcelate the brain for every region. We have the volume, surface area, fractal dimension, a whole bunch of morphometry measures. So we compile, here is my computable data object. Computable data object, 1,000 individuals, 7,500 features. And then we do uh, both model-based and model-free inference. In a model-free inference, we're interested in, well, you know, pretend we don't know anything about these patients because we don't, it's a census. The UK Biobank is essentially a population census. So we said, okay, we don't know anything about these individuals. Go ahead and do a kind of clustering, you know, complete clustering of the data. Turns out we use hierarchical. In this case, two clusters emerge over and over again no matter how we start with the data. You know, um, cluster one and cluster two, right? Um, and as you can see between the k-means clustering and the hierarchical, there was a fair amount of agreement, right? Whoever is in cluster one on one clustering was in the same cluster according to the separate and independent clustering. And then we did this repeatedly with different initial conditions multiple times, and we observed the consistency of getting individuals to fall within the same group is very, very high. In other words, if you and I are in the same group at one clustering, we are extremely likely to be in the same group using a different type of clustering. The variance was very, very small. The cluster sizes mysteriously were, it was pretty balanced, you know, about half and half. And there is a silhouette measure of how good the clustering is. And then we actually wanted to answer the following question. Now the clinician is gonna always ask you a question. Fine, you've got two groups. But what does it mean? You know, what are these two groups? Can you explicate these groups in something that I understand in terms of the clinical phenotype of these individuals? That's the question that every clinician wants to know and every research scientist wants to know. So remember, thousands of different features for the two clusters. So what we do here is we actually look at these, these measures and try to find out which of these measures contributes significantly to separating these clusters, right? To segregating these clusters. And that gives us 
an explication of which variables are important to separate. If you want a more explicit um, uh, example, here is one where we looked at trying to explicate depression feelings. One of the 4,300 clinical measures was a measure called depression feelings. We try to predict here using a decision tree method to predict decision tree. And then here is the decision tree, right? You start off, you ask about some of the psychological state of the individual, their gender and so forth. And then this decision tree separates them into groups and it reports the probability that if you fall within this group, um, you're 56% likely to be part of one depression feeling cluster versus the other one, right? Some groups are better separated, like this group, for example, is perfectly separated. They're almost exclusively of the second type, right? Uh, th this group here is predominantly of the first type, and so is this one, right? So in this decision tree, we can actually find out or explicate uh, some of the clinically relevant information. Uh, we also looked at not only uh, uh, depression, we looked at sensitivity, uh, warrior, uh, types, miserableness that people have reported, and then we report the accuracy of various methods. Uh, this is, of course, using random forest classification, and this is cross-validation, tenfold cross-validation. So in the final part, um, and I know pr probably people would have questions. I, I, I think we're going to have a chance in about 10, 15 minutes to ask the questions at the end. Um, but I'm going to now transition to a new method that we are developing, which is very, very interesting. It essentially answers the following question. Um, why are we doing repeated multiple sampling when we want to do an inference on a data set? And the argument is that the reason why we're making repeated samples, think about fMRI. Most of us know functional magnetic resonance imaging. The subject stands, sits in the scanner and is repeatedly undergoing the same conditioning, the same uh, stimulus, the same state, and we measure um, the, the corresponding both signal repeatedly. And the reason for this is that the signal to noise ratio is so small, about 4%, that, and the noise level is so high that if you just look at an instance at a one observation, you're never going to be able to find any effect of the external stimulus on the brain activation network or the brain activation regions. There is no way to do it. So what do you do? Well, we use the tried and tested method for a thousand years. That's what Cavendish did 200 years ago to establish the mean density of the earth. What did he do? He required 23 observations and he averaged them. Once he averaged them, a statistician told him that he needs to compute also the variability. No problem. That's how we estimate the confidence interval. That's exactly what happens with the fMRI. Why averaging though? And I'm sure everybody has asked this question. Why averaging? Because averaging acts as a denoising. And once you denoise, the signal to noise ratio increases. Now, in the framework that we are proposing is we're generalizing the notion of event longitudinal order, something that we refer as time. We're generalizing this notion as a two-dimensional complex time, something that we call time. And it's got this mathematical representation over here. So in other words, to compress the three-dimensional space universe, okay, of up, down, left, and right. The, the three-dimensional space is here in this diagram compressed into a single dimensional line, and orthogonal to it, we actually have the two-dimensional complex time. The radius, the radial direction of how far are you gives you the time displacement or the longitudinal event order, but then there is a second variable. It's not just how far away, it's what phase direction you're into. And this is the important thing. So if you understand this notion of complexifying the notion of time and this kind of diagram kind of tells you, so this event right up here, X and, X and Y are two different spatial locations, just like my two hands. But two points on the red, cir on the le on the red circle, there are two events that happen at the X spatial location whereas the points over here on the blue circle, they happen at the separate Y location. So these events here, these events, kappa one and kappa four, occur at exactly the same longitudinal instance, at exactly the same time, but they're multiple instantiations. 
So in fMRI lingo, this is fMRI repeat one, repeat two under the same states. Now, kappa two is different from kappa one because kappa two and kappa two have different radii. In other words, they're, they appear at the same location, X, X okay? But they are taken at two different longitudinal space, um, uh, longitudinal space times. As you can imagine, there is different mathematical representations. We can represent that complex plane in multiple coordinates. Now, let me give you one important thing of why is it necessary to model this notion of the phase of time. And I understand this is a little bit of a heuristic example. It, it, it only, it, it's a cartoon, if you wish, but it represents the importance of capturing the right phases of the time observations. So we're gonna start with two images. One is a square on the left, and right here in the middle, I have a disc. Each of these two images, we are gonna pipe through the Fourier transform and get the Fourier, the real part of the Fourier transform, the magnitude of the Fourier transform of the square, and the phase of the Fourier transform of the square. Here on the right-hand side, I have exactly the same three features. A plot of the real image of the Fourier transform, which by the way, is a complex number. That's why we're taking only the real part of it. The magnitude is the square of the real part plus the square of the imaginary part, square root of. And then the phase is the actual arc tangent of the uh, x over y. Now, if you abandon the phases, if you, for a second, ignore the phases and try to invert uh, the Fourier transform by using the magnitudes and the phases, you're gonna get a perfect square, right? If you use the right magnitude and the phase of the square, you get the square. But if you use the um, square magnitude, if you use this magnitude, but, new, but the, 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 the phase of the disk, so in other words, you take this with that instead of this with that to recover the disk, the, the square, you get something that looks like a disk square. It's a disk square. It's a blend. And it's got certain, as you can see, aliasing effects here. So the phase information is critical to do the inference. If you completely abandon the phase, if you say, I don't know the phase, I'm gonna set this whole thing to be zero, flat image, and I'm gonna take these two with a flat phase, invert the Fourier transform, I get something that, yeah, topologically it's a square, all right, but as an imaging, it's a star-shaped object, okay? That has a negative curvature for that matter, right? So if you do exactly the same thing, starting with the magnitude of the disk and use the square phases instead, you get something that kind of looks like a, the square circle here, but it's a circle square here, right? A little bit of a different ringing effect. But look what happens over here. If you negate the phases, the magnitudes of the, uh, of the disk are pretty much sufficient because look, this and this image, I am comfortable doing inference on this instead of on that. So in other words, the phase for the circle did not make a whole bunch of difference the phase of the, of the square made a much more significant difference. So ignoring the kind phases corresponds to essentially doing what we've been doing for a while, space-time standard classical analytics. In the extension space, in this higher dimensional manifold that we call space-time, uh, things are a little bit different. And here's a schematic, for instance, of what happens to a real fMRI data, okay, here, here is a, a, a two-dimensional uh, fMRI data that we're gonna look across time and we're only going to be plotting an isosurface. Now, because, you know, if you plot the whole fMRI solid volume over time, you're not gonna be able to peer through it, right? So we're just plotting the isosurfaces. You see, you see how different the isosurfaces are if you ignore the phases and how much more detail in the isosurfaces is available if you account for the corresponding phases. So it is important, I'm making the argument to understand the kind phases. Now, uh, one can ask, well, what's the rationale for doing this? Well, the rationale is threefold. First of all, in a mathematical sense, Minkowski four-dimensional space-time that we are all very accustomed to using is an unsettling beast, right? Because time is only positive real. It doesn't even form, it, it forms algebraically a multiplicative group, all right? But um, uh, because it allows a multiplicative inversion, but it but it's not a complete algebraic field, 
right? Because simply the additive, the additive unit is zero, does not allow you to invert additively. You can't, you can't go to a time minus five. It, so you, you can do really nice things that we are accustomed to. So it's not a field. Second of all, equations of this type have no solutions in time, okay? Whereas in time, an, a polynomial of order n has precisely n, uh, n, n solutions. So this notion from a mathematical sense, it's much more settling to have space time represent a field as opposed to a partial, uh, uh, you know, multiplicative algebraic group. The second important characteristic is in physics, space kind formulation allows us to solve some of the problems of time. And here's a reference. I'm not going to dwell too much into this. But the third one is where most of you are going to be interested in. For artificial intelligence and data science, space kind representations allow us to transform random IID sampling into a different strategy for acquiring and interpreting repeated experimental conditions. Second of all, it allows a Bayesian representation of that inference. It allows tensor-based modeling on what you're going to see in a second are called time surfaces. And it allows the development of really, really innovative AI and machine learning techniques. OK. Also, I need to let you know that um, it's natural when you define a new space, right? Can you do calculus in this space? That's, that's the first question a mathematician is going to ask you, right? Can you do differentiation? And the answer is yes. You can do Wertinger type derivatives on, these, on the kind variable, which remember is a two dimensional uh, uh, complex time representation. And here are the, 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 the kind derivatives uh, in Cartesian coordinates, in polar coordinates in uh, conjugate pairs and so forth. And once you have integration, the opposite operation is called, um, uh, I'm sorry, once you have differentiation, the opposite operation is called integration. We can actually define the path integral and correspondingly the area integral, indefinite integral, uh, Laplacian operators, as it's stated here in conjugate pairs terms uh, and so forth. So now with all this, uh, 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 kind of basic fundamental science, what is truly the relation between um, uh, artificial intelligence, quantum mechanics, and data science? This is a very simple table that we drew to show that what we call in mathematical physics particles, these become objects in data science. What we call observables become features. States become datum. Systems become problems. And the most important one, what physicists refer to as wave functions in data science and AI, they become inference functions. And that's where we are going to be spending a whole lot of time. Here is just one example. Uh, you know, when you talk about uh, the wave function, the wave function is a solution to certain equation. It's got certain behavior. We can plot it. We can, we can project, you know, uh, how it propagates in space-time, we can do the dynamics of these elements and so forth. So a lot is known about wave functions. Well, the same thing, so here is one of the two examples, actually, of how we do these wave functions now. Remember, they're inference functions in our little space. The first example is just a standard linear model-based representation of a solution. So right up here, the inference function is going to be a function of, the, of, of, of all the data that includes both predictors and outcomes, okay? So this inference function is simply the one that's used when we do the classical, um, uh, for instance, ordinary least squares estimates, right? You're given the x and y, you manipulate these things, here is the inference function. Once I have the beta estimates, I can say, well, what's the likelihood that these beta coefficients are not trivial? So this leads me to probability values and from probability values to likelihood, and therefore I can do predictions. In the non-parametric, non-linear case, Something very similar happens in support vector machine classification, for example. We have uh, a lifting function that increases dimensionality of my data in such a way that some of the nonlinear borders in the lower dimensional space can be inflated to become more of a linear borders or um, barriers between different classes of functions. This can also be formulated as an inference function in terms of the observations, as you can see. And, and, and this kind of shows you the parallel between the two types of strategies here, from quantum mechanics to artificial intelligence. So how do we do this space-time inference? 
Well, we're going to do exactly what um, crystallographers have done for many, many decades, at least half a century. They've basically looked at um, uh, the uh, 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 projections, the um, uh, projections of, of bombarding various crystals that they generate with high energy particles, and they look at the diffraction patterns that are on the back. They can estimate the magnitudes of the diffractions, but not the phases. And they've invented strategies to handle that. That's precisely what we're going to be doing. We're going to be using similar strategy, but in our case, it's going to be a transformation like the Fourier transform or the Laplace transform that's going to allow us to do this uh, to infer the enigmatic phases. And here is just uh, one example. Uh, here is, again, the astrosurface that I show you. When you recover this thing using no phase or no information about the phase, you, you, you get the ISO surface on the left. When you use the right phases, you get a little bit more topologically correct ventricular uh, uh, projection of, of, of that time course of just one two-dimensional uh, slice. In the true three-dimensional case, Imagine me picking just one voxel of the fMRI data at one specific location and tracking it over time. What I want to do now is I want to recut that time voxel as a time surface, as a complex time surface, where time, again, represents the radial direction on this surface, and the phase, uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, and the phase represents the angular direction of this, of this, uh, of this magnitude. So this is an idealized, this is an idealized fMRI series for just one voxel location. Now, if you want to know what happens for, for, for multiple representations, um, because we're kind of running out of time a little bit, I will skip over uh, the Bayesian representation um, and just show you perhaps, yeah, th th this one example. Suppose I'm having a, a finger tapping, a finger tapping uh, experiment. Here, here is one example that, that's kind of uh, illustrated here. I can reconstruct the on and off, so people are doing this and then resting. Doing it again, remember they repeated, resting again. Doing the finger tapping again and resting. So what we can do is we can extract, to go to a specific location, extract the data, and then ultimately reconstruct what we call the uh, on-off fMRI kind surface. So this is the entire fMRI looking as a surface, because now this surface has interesting topology and interesting geometry. It's got curvature, some areas are highly curved, some areas are highly flat. You know, this is information that we can use then to actually pinpoint that exactly the somatosensory cortex is where the statistical analysis happened to be for this highly uh, sensitive data. So in the last few minutes before we open up for questions, I want to let you know that, again, our group at the Statistics Online Computational Resource and the Michigan Institute for Data Science is firm supporters of data science. We are working on big data analytics. Uh, we are sharing all of our code Many services are available on the Soccer uh, website. GitHub projects and apps are available for you to uh, interact with. And uh, the secret sauce, just like for many other groups, is teamwork. You know, here is, here is the team that has produced all of these and many more resources, and here is our funding. So with that, thank you very much, and I'll be happy, uh, Professor Van Horn, if there are any questions to address them in the last few minutes. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Dino, thank you so much for that uh, amazing talk. That's a fantastic amount of work. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. We have a, co have a question from uh, one of our uh, viewers uh, who has two questions. Um, one is, practically speaking, who would I need to include on my study team in order to use the data sifter tool? Um, they uh, felt that uh, they might not be quite uh, adroit enough at using a, a GitHub or understanding how to navigate it, um, and who could they reach out to to better understand that? Their yeah. second so, question, so, oh, I'll ask you, you answer that one first, I'll ask the second question in a second. Okay, so the, the answer to the first question is, uh, thank you for that question. Uh, it, it's a good question. So the answer is, is twofold. First of all, if you're doing this for some kind of a monetary incentive, you have to go through and get a license for this product. Okay, so you have to go through the University of Michigan, it's a patented technology, you get, you, you, you get a license and use it. If you use it for research and education, then you go to the, to the website, download the code, and, and obviously, as you can imagine, highly complicated software are not very easy. We're not, we're not uh, you know, uh, Google, we're, we're not uh, Facebook, you know, we don't have enough to, to make production quality code. So you will have to have an IT expert to help you deploy it and run it on, on your system. 
if you know, that makes sense. One follow-up question to that. Are there any sure. IRB concerns um, that you've run into with people using this? I'm thinking of you know, data anonymization versus obfuscation. Do IRBs have any problem with that? Yeah, so, th this is, so remember, the issue is that the data governor, whoever owns the data, they get to decide the level of obfuscation. You still need an IRB even if you go to the highest level for synthetically generating data, simply because the IRB needs to have a non-human exemption for you. If you're at an academic institution, I believe at any other institution, you still have to go, but, but these, these are expeditious. Now, if you intend to share data that's somewhere in the, in the middle level, right? M m small, moderate to large obfuscation, you have to go through the rigorous now full-blown IRB approval where you have to actually do a case study to find out how identifiable because the risk will not be zero. But look, if you're looking for zero risk, uh, yeah. you, you, you need to cl close shop and, and, and just do nothing. Yeah. Uh, but, <laughs> Fair but, enough. But, but, but yeah. Fair enough. Uh, the, the second question was uh, regarding the missingness not at random and uh, whether or not um, we were all understanding correctly that for the UK biobank, in particular, the cancer um, case studies that features with less than 70% completeness were thrown out. Um, I missed what to do about that. Uh, this particular asker is asking, uh, what do you do about that when you find that situation? That is, that is an excellent question. And to be perfectly honest with you, this is the art, okay? <laughs> Why is this the art? Because there is no rule of thumb. If anybody told, told you that they have a recipe, don't trust them, it's wrong. Uh, but the, 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 the basic strategy, not a recipe, but a strategy is what Box and Box a long time ago has said, if you know something has an effect, model it. Everything else you have to randomize. Now, what this means in that, to answer that specific question is that you have to ask yourself, is there a rationale for me to expect some of these cases to be missing? And if the answer is yes, then you have to put some kind of a correction factor on this value that you added. You have to add, it, you, you have to add an uncertainty to that specific value, if you know what I mean. If you don't know, uh, then to be perfectly strict about, you know, to be orthodoxal, the statistician is going to say, well, you know, if the data is not missing at random, I can't do anything for you simply because either you tell me what the missing pattern or, or, or the missing effect is, or if you know it's not at random, we just can't do anything because we, we, ju we just don't know. You know, you're shooting in the dark. So it is an art, but speaking with an expert will help you figure out ways to introduce reasonable, not perfect, but reasonable way of imputing your data sets. Okay. One other uh, question I have, uh, Evo, is the the Kime uh, concept is fascinating, and I'm, you've looked at you look like you're looking at time series analytics using this. I was kind of curious if you've extended this to network theoretical examination, where the networks are working on the Kime space instead of in say standard time, for example. Yeah. Uh, this is a great uh, question, Jack. We haven't gotten to that point yet. We have not yet worked at the networks, uh, but it is it's, it's certainly a very, very interesting uh, question, and it will be interesting to see how the networks reflect this notion of the of the kind phase and kind magnitude. So I, I don't have an answer, unfortunately, for you yet. I just would be interested to, to hear about that when you get around to it, um, because of course that phase differential between different locations in that space is gonna be reflective of any sort of time lag that might be between them. Um, and that could carry some useful information, um, you know, about rates of information flow and, you know, you could extend that to information theoretical frameworks as well. Obviously a natural extension of some of the work in the Bayesian space that you've been working in. Absolutely, yeah. Fantastic. Well, I think we've kind of reached the end of our hour, and uh, I really want to thank uh, uh, my 
colleague and friend, uh, uh, Ivo Dinov, for sharing some of his amazing work with us. Uh, this has really been helpful to, one, contextualize what we think of with big data analytics uh, in the brain space and uh, some strategies to kind of address it, uh, to uh, examine it, and then to uh, conceptualize it. I really appreciate you taking the time today, uh, Dr. Dinov. So thank you. And thank you to everyone for joining us. And uh, everyone, we will see you next week. In the meantime, have a great weekend. Thanks very much.